Hello everybody and welcome to our GCP Mindset channel. Today we speak about the third step of quality risk management according to GCP. And in the meanwhile we reach section 504 risk control. Hello again, as you have heard, we wanted to create and show you a short pragmatic guide to establish a systematic quality risk management system which complies with the revision 2 of GCP. In the first video I spoke about risk identification and in the second uh, video about risk evaluation. If you have not watched those videos yet, please stop watching this video. It does not make any sense without the first two steps. We have identified our study risk and focus on the really essential risk which might have a significant impact on our study. Afterwards, we quantified our study risk, which means we created a risk factor based on the impact that an uncertain issue might have, the likelihood that the uncertain issue occur and the detectability of this issue. In our example we used a range of 1 which means an extremely small risk up to 100 which would mean a very high risk. So what next? In section 504 risk control we read the sponsor should decide which risk to reduce and or which risk to accept. The approach used to reduce risk to an acceptable level should be proportionate to the significance of the risk. Risk reduction activities may be incorporated in protocol study design and implementation and monitoring plans, agreements between parties, defining roles and responsibilities, systematic safeguards to ensure adherence to SOPs and training. That I guess is logic. If we know from the beginning already how we can reduce certain risk, we should do it in the study documents we prepare prior to study start. For example, we consider pregnancy in our study as a high risk. We should not enroll female patients with childbearing potential. We require pregnancy tests and a very safe contraception method. However, the tricky thing with risk is that they are quite uncertain. We do not know if certain issues happen or we know based on our experience that they will happen, but we do not know to which extent they really will happen. For example, in a larger multinational study, I know the risk that serious adverse events will not be reported in time does exist. I know it since it nearly always happens that there, there are few sites which are not reporting the serious adverse events in time. Or they forgot the serious adverse event definitions. Or they just are not available to report the serious adverse events. So I'm very aware about the risk, but I don't know yet to which extent this will happen. In regards to the uncertainty, GCP says predefined quality tolerance limits should be established, taking into consideration the medical and statistical characteristics of the variables as well as the statistical design of the trial to identify systematic issues that can impact subject safety or reliability of trial results. Detection of deviations from the predefined quality tolerance limit should trigger an evaluation to determine if actions is needed. This means that I need to think about to which extent the occurrence of issues is okay. It is not good that these issues happen, but in regards to the impact on my study, they might be okay. And the border between okay and not okay anymore, these are the predefined quality tolerance limits. There will be issues for which I cannot tolerate any deviation because we need to protect the well-being of our study subjects or we can also not tolerate deviations against official legislations, regulations or laws. For other issues you might say that you do not need to know every tiny little issue, however, when the number of the same issue reached a particular level, the predefined tolerance limit, that you want to be informed about it. A typical key risk factor which reflects data quality might be the number of queries or the number of queries per study site, which gives you information about the risky study sites in terms of data quality issues. You probably do not want to know whether a study site has one or two open data queries which need to be answered. However, you want to be aware when the number of queries reached a level where you say clearly, you, now your study team needs to become active and trigger 
certain actions to reduce the number of queries. To define the tolerance limits is a very tricky part of quality risk management, which might become very subjective depending on the people who decide about these tolerance limits. If we involve control freaks who actually don't like risk, who are very scared of any deviations as they want that everything works perfectly and nobody can blame them for losing control, the, these tolerance limits might be very low. And that means the whole advantage of quality risk management might get lost. On the other hand, if we involve only people who never see a problem, who think everything will work well if we really believe in it or if we work really hard for it, the tolerance limits might be too high. This would be typically the case when founders or CEOs or other upper management people of small startup companies define these tolerance limits. They are quite risk affine, therefore they founded or lead a startup company. This belongs to their personality and as a result it might cause an underestimation of risk within clinical trials. So upper management might be too risk affine, the control freaks on the other hand would never be founder of a startup organization as they see too many risks which might create the risk of never getting started with the study. Thus also for this step of quality risk management it is important that an experienced team which views from different angles are involved when the tolerance levels or limits are predefined. If you do not have enough people in your team ask for consultancy support. It is anyway wise and a good idea to involve from time to time neutral people for quality risk management to avoid operational blindness. When you decide on the tolerance limits you should define a relationship between your risk factor and these tolerance limits. If the calculated risk factor is 100 which means the highest risk the tolerance limit should be low. If we calculate for some risk a lower risk factor which means we are going on the x-axis to the left hand side the tolerance level will increase. Just to make sure that this principle is understandable a little exercise. Let's imagine we want to evaluate a high number of major protocol deviation as a key risk factor. Our study is a phase 2 study and we want to enroll 100 patients. The first major protocol deviations probably does not mean any high risk for the study. However, at a particular tolerance limit you should start worrying. According to your biostatistician in your team, 20 major protocol deviations are okay for your study. So that means your study really can live with these 20 major protocol deviations. 20 major protocol deviations of 100 patients means they are just 80 patients without any major protocol deviations. Yeah? But if you as a project management team learn about these 20 major protocol deviations it might be even too late. So you want to get uh, alerted already when you reach 80%. That would mean in our example your tolerance limit would be at 16 cases. So now my questions. What would change in the relationship between the same key risk factor and the tolerance limit was in a phase 4 study with 1000 patients. So in our first example we spoke about a phase 2 study with 100 patients. Now we change this relationship uh, to a phase 4 study with 1000 patients. Yes exactly your tolerance limit would increase which means that you can live with more protocol deviations within your study and you don't need to worry after you have reached 16 cases but much later. So I hope you can see that quality risk management is no real rocket science. However, once again you need to have a system which is based on numbers and algorithms. If something is not understandable, send us your questions, leave your comments in the comments section. I hope you liked our video. See you the next time. Bye bye.